Children are excited tonight. They get a little extra special treat back there, so they're they're excited about that. Amen. I'm sorry, you guys don't get a special treat. I know what you're thinking. James chapter one. The Bible says James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, dear Lord, for the songs that have been sung, the fellowship that has been enjoyed, the prayers that have gone up, and the Word of God that we have just read. I ask, sweet Holy Spirit of God, that you would forgive me of my sins and fill me to be able to preach and teach the Word of God with truth, without heresy. And dear Lord, once again, we're praying for those on the prayer list and those that are in need, those that are in hurt uh, this evening. And dear God, that you would uh, meet their needs as only you can, heal those that are afflicted, and raise those up that are hurting. Please meet the need of every person in this uh, building tonight. Praying for the Children's Church. It was a joy to see the children and how they uh, sit through the song service, dear God. And praying that you will speak to their hearts, be with the teachers, the teaching. And if there happens to be one in the building that's not saved, they can get saved it's too late and strengthen the children of God. I ask it in Jesus' name for his sake. Amen. In James chapter 1, the Bible says James is a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's been a lot of uh, thought and study on which James this is. There's several Jameses in the Bible. There's a lot of Marys in the Bible. And uh, more than not, say that this is uh, James, the half brother of Jesus, and uh, his his brethren did not believe on him in his life until after the resurrection, and then they believed on him, even though they grew up around him. And uh, it, it 
takes the revealing of the Word of God uh, to make you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, the Word of God does that. He says to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting, and so there are not 10 lost tribes as Armstrong would have taught back in the day, but uh, they're, they're all there. God knows where they are. They are scattered, but it's also represented that the child of God is sprinkled throughout the world as well. God has his children sprinkled, scattered throughout the world. And uh, we, we don't have to be scattered per se in a negative sense, but God has his children, I like to call it sprinkled throughout the world to be light, to be salt where they are, wherever they live, wherever they work, and God has them there. And praise God that you're here this evening. And he says, uh, my brethren, that is a term of endearment in the Bible. It means a Christian. It means a child of God. Count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. And uh, this brother that was used by the Holy Spirit of God to pen these words went through tribulation. So he would understand that and he would be able to write to that. And uh, most were martyred. I think maybe only uh, John beloved maybe died a natural death of age, but he was exiled on the Isle of Patmos, and others say he was bull in a pot of oil. So they knew about tribulation in those days. And he says, uh, knowing this, this trying of your faith worketh patience, I'm talking about faith in Jesus, worketh patience, but let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. I, I want to attempt this evening, and it will be a feeble attempt, you know, at best. But this is the phrase that piqued my interest within this, and, uh, you know, last week, and then uh, resonated with me. It's in verse 4, but let patience have her perfect work. And that's, that's what I want to attempt to speak on, the perfect work of patience. The perfect work of patience. You, you don't really think about patience in a, in a good way, really. And uh, I, I certainly never did as a young person, but um, he says not only that it's considered in a positive light here, but it says perfect work. Perfect work. And um, this would be graduate school for a Christian. Th th this book and uh, its practical Christianity it's, it's mentioned as well in Hebrews, but this would be at, at the graduate level. Yeah, a, a young person always wants to grow up and begin the next phases of their life. You know that. They want to gain independence from adult rule, and then they realize some rules and regulations are best when we get to that point. But uh, all, all of the young people want to attempt to gain that independence and get to the next level, graduate from this year to that year, and a year seems so long in the eyes of a child. I remember that, you remember that, and uh, some of you are still you know, very young and you understand that, but the older we get, they, they go faster. But uh, the, the young person, they, they, they work their way through grade school. And you, you think about all of those things that, that go on in, in grade school, if you, if you went to the public school or if you're even homeschooled, and all of those, we would look back and see menial tasks along the way, but they were monumental tasks then, of times tables and those types of things, working your way up through. And then you go to middle school, and there's change in physical and mental capacities, and then you've arrived when you reach high school. Individual that goes through those stages, and, and some maybe even go on to college. And uh, if an individual uh, drops out of school, and I, I, I taught public education for 31 years, so with, with, with all of the things that we had in place, there was still doing good to have just above 71 to 75% graduation rate. And that was doing good over national averages. 
But if, if, they, if they choose not to complete school because of the rigor, they eventually they'll, they'll grow older and realize that maybe they're more dependent uh, on others than if they would have stayed and finished. Now that statement is not always 100% true, I understand that, and I'm not belittling. Uh, my mom and dad, neither one of them finished school. But uh, I, I don't know of anybody that worked harder than my dad, you know. And uh, he was a coal miner in World War II and then a union carpenter and was extremely talented in it. So I, I'm not knocking that. And there, those were difficult times back in those times and the depression and, the, and all of that. So I, I'm not belittling that. I'm just saying that uh, we do in, encourage them to complete where I'm going with that is that as they progress through those different levels and so forth, they have to endure uh, difficulty. And it's difficult at each of those levels, very difficult. But uh, you, you are thankful that, of those that, that choose to go on and complete and so forth. I, I'm thankful for good doctors. And praise God that they completed what they needed to complete. You would want your heart doctor to have completed. Uh, you would want your uh, doctors to have completed. And it, there was an endurance that they had to go through. And praise God for that, that they did. But it, it takes patience. It takes endurance and so forth. And then typically, the, the, the higher that one can uh, attain to in some of these levels, the, the less dependent that they have to, to be, and uh, they can be more independent and so forth. That, that's a general statement, but more so in Christianity. Uh, God doesn't want you and me to stay as a babe in Christ. And uh, he tells us to grow in grace and knowledge of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He desires that but he knows it's best as well that you would complete and not drop out. Not draw the line and say, this is far enough. Grade school was enough. Middle school was enough. Or high school, or those types of things. He wants you to grow up. He wants you to go further for God. He wants you to go further with God and in your Christian growth because uh, there are situations that are going to enter into your life. And uh, he, he wants you to be able to handle them. He, he wants you to be able to fly. He wants you to mount up with wings as eagles. But you're not going to be able to do that unless you allow patience to have her perfect work. It, it, it is a, it's a work that works in you. We have to be able to be ready and to be prepared. You, you tell the children you're going to have to do this to be able to face the world that is out there. The children don't know the world right now as you and I know it. And you want them to be able to be prepared to face the world. And all of the schooling and the things that your parents taught you and brought you up and nurtured you was to prepare you to be able to face the world. It's that much and more in your spiritual life. God doesn't want you to be a Christian casualty. God doesn't want you to drop out. God wants you to be prepared to face what lies ahead. The Bible says that, uh, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations. Verse 2. Divers means many. Divers means varied and it's when you fall into these temptations. It's not if, it's when. The Bible says that man that is born of a woman is of few days and full of trouble. As the sparks fly upward, it's just as sure that sparks fly upward and uh, you are born unto trouble. It's sad to say that there's a whole lot of Christians that fall short of graduating into those higher levels of Christ. Because they do not allow, verse 4, of letting 
patience have her perfect work. There would no doubt be some people that would go on to higher education if it weren't for all of the rigorous work. I'm, I'd be one of them. And uh, it's at different times in life that you're prepared. I understand that as well. Uh, I couldn't get a hold of math until I got into the construction trades. I mean, the Pythagorean theorem, I couldn't understand until I had to square up a building and then it made sense. But I couldn't get that. And a child of God has to be prepared along the way. And so this evening, quickly, this lesson is the perfect work of patience. The perfect work of patience is the full reward of the effect produced by the cause. It's cause and effect. Patience is endurance and trials. That's what he's speaking about here. Patience is endurance and trials. The end result of that is growth and maturity in Christianity. Why? Because you can't always choose what is going to be the next trial, temptation, or tribulation. And some of these you cause yourself, and others you don't cause at all. Job didn't cause his, and uh, Paul didn't cause a lot of his, but uh, I've caused a lot of mine, and a lot are just because uh, you are a human being. They're just trials and tribulations, and you don't get to pick and choose the one. You, you don't make up the test so that you can pass it. If I could stack the decks and make my own tests, I could have passed them. But there were pop tests, and there were quizzes, and there were uh, along the way, and had to get used to being able to take a test. And you run to take tests as a Christian. And so you, you have to have endurance and patience so that you can pass these tests. And you don't just get to say, I won't take the test. They're going to come. And then when you do, it prepares you to be able to handle the next one. The perfect work of patience is getting you to the level that you are able to handle the temptation without falling out or falling apart. Test anxiety. The perfect work of patience is to grow up and to go on to maturity in Christianity. He says, to make you complete, he says. To make you complete. If you see here, he says in verse 4, but let patience have a perfect work that you may be perfect, that is mature and entire or complete and wanting or lacking nothing as a Christian. Babies have to have it their way. You understand that. Don't throw an absolute fit. And, and typically, if you've had one, you will address the issue, typically quickly. But toddlers aren't a whole lot different, but they are taught to wait. And then teens typically make most of their mistakes because they don't wait. Young adults make most of their decisions thinking they know better than you who have been through it. Abraham had the promises of God that he was going to be a father of many nations. And he knew that. God told him that. Promised him that. And yet there came to a point of, of question and probably some doubt because of the time differentiation in the first announcement of the promise and the fruition of it, and mistakes were made. And you have Ishmael and uh, all that you have going on today with uh, the battle because of, of Hagar and Abraham trying to be assertive and saying, won't you use Ishmael, and God says, no, it is not Ishmael. It's not going to be Ishmael. 
It's going to be Isaac. And you will have a son. And Jacob was going to be the chosen one of God. There was a struggling. And Jacob was going to be the chosen one of God to continue the, the nation with God's choosing over Esau. And yet he took it upon himself to steal the birthright and the blessing of the way that God had ordained. And it, it brought a lot of discord. When Jacob ran to his uncle, one preacher said it's never recorded that he and his mother got to embrace each other again. The one that kind of helped him out in the deception process with the, the hair and, and all those types of things. And after Esau said, I'll kill him. His mother intervened and said, go, go to Uncle Laban. And he did, and he went to Laban's. But there's never a recording that mama got to see the baby boy again. Difficulty. There was discord between those two brothers until the night of the wrestling and then they met and embraced, and there's a perfect picture of forgiveness. I'm saying it's just difficulty, even though Jacob was going to have that. You've got promises too. You've got a book full of promises. And the, the Bible says here, but let patience have a perfect work. I, I don't like patience. You don't like patience as far as time delays, time constraints for people but I got a book full of promises. And I have to count on those promises. And there's a book full of illustrations and stories of people that had promises that did not wait and got into a mess, even though there was blessings at the end that could have saved themselves a lot of grief. And then it's written for your admonition and my admonition. Full-aged adults, talking about Christians, ought to be able to come to the place where they allow patience to perform its perfect work. It's endurance training. Physically, if you were to uh, physically exercise, the physical body will respond to that. Spiritually speaking, it's more important because bodily exercise profiteth little but spiritually, your spirit will respond to spiritual workouts. He says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God that worketh in you to do of his good will. The perfect work of patience. The psalmist David said in Psalm 40, verse 1, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. I'll give you three quick thoughts this evening for the, this message. As feebly and incomplete as I can, but this is, it is my thought. But let patience have her perfect work. You think about patience working in you? How many times do you get impatient? How many times have you got aggravated for having to be patient? How many times have you failed the test of being patient? How many times do you feel full of joy when you have to be patient? I'd say if you're honest, not, not many. And yet the Bible says, but let patience have a perfect work. God must know something about this that you and I reject of allowing patience to work in us. It's about passing the test. It's about test taking. All right, here, here's number one. And uh, quickly and very simply this evening on the perfect work of patience has to do with denial of self. Number one, denial of self. 
just as the little children next door want it and want it now. As adults, we've learned to restrain that type of speaking, but in our heart, it's still there. We still want it, and we want it now, and we do want it our way. The perfect work of patience is a denial of self. It is not a robbery of who you are. It's simply a denial of self. And if you notice this in Zechariah chapter 4, right at the end of the Old Testament, Zechariah chapter 4. Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. Zechariah chapter 4. And in verse 6. Speaking of Zerubbabel, foundation, temple, those types of things. God is always interested in his place of worship, by the way. And I realize that in this dispensation, it is in the child of God, but there is still the desire of his children coming together in a collective worship service. In Zechariah chapter 4, and in verse 6, the Bible says, Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, this is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. I'm trying to get to that point. It's a work. It is the perfect work of patience. It's a work. It's a lifelong work. But it is a work of progress. For the individual to come to this conclusion that it is not by you and what you can manufacture and what you can muster up, but it is by his spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. If you're going to allow patience to have its perfect work, there's going to have to be a denial of self and reliance on the Holy Spirit of God. Me, myself, and I are those self-actuating statements. And uh, you understand Maslow's and his hierarchy of needs and all these types of things. But when it becomes me, myself, and I, then there is somewhat of a, a level of you without others, you without dependence on others, uh, and, and you preeminent, and, and God won't allow that to happen. There has to be a denial. The denial of self places God first, others second, yourself last. A denial of self is manifested in moving past carnality or fleshly lusts and fleshly desires into spirituality. It's putting off the old man and putting on the new man. It's moving from infancy to maturity. Without taking time, it's 1 Corinthians 3, verses 1 through 7, about the carnal Christian or the spiritual. If it's having to have things your way, if it's having to win an argument or you're right or being upset most of the time, those are indications of infancy in spirituality. Overly sensitive, easily offended, seeking vengeance, holding grudges, letting failure get the best of you, those are Infancy. The Bible says, Great peace have they that love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. It's Psalm 119, verse 165. The perfect work of patience is endurance through temptations and through tests to deny self and to count fully on Christ. So, number one, I said, in this perfect work of patience, it is a denial of self. Number two, it's a dependence upon God. It is a dependence upon God. Why do you think that the test came? Who do you think permitted the test? There, there's, there's two thoughts. There is temptations where the devil tempts you to get you to fall. If the devil can tempt you to get you to fall, it's to get you to quit. And there are 
trials that the Lord sends to strengthen you, to get you able to handle the next temptation or the next situation and to help you not to hurt you. A dependence upon God. Look at just a couple of these in Psalm chapter 27. The, the thought, the message, the truth is as old as, as mankind. The Psalms written probably 2,000 years before Christ, 1,000 years before Christ, 3,000 years before now. In Psalm 27, the Bible says in verse 14, this is a psalm of David. Well, just look at verse 13. David had many trials. He had many temptations. The devil was out to get him. The Lord was there to strengthen him. Why? Because he had a task to do. He had a job to do. He said, I had fainted, verse 13, unless I believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Of course you're going to understand the goodness of the Lord in heaven. There's nothing but good in heaven. But he says, in the land of the living. He says, I, I have to see, believe, and know that God is good right now. And he said, I, I'd faint it if I hadn't believed that. Why? Because there was troubles on every side. Verse 14, wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. It's a personal testimony. Look at Psalm 37. Before we go on, we'll look at one more here. Psalm 37. I said the perfect work of patience has to do with denial of self and then dependence upon God. In Psalm 37 and in verse 34, the Bible says, wait on the Lord and keep his way. And he shall exalt thee to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, thou shalt see it. There is a differentiation between the, the saved, the lost, waiting on the Lord. And you'll see the end thereof. The work of patience is a work of endurance. It is to help the Christian with a greater exercise of faith so that you can pass the next test that you undergo. And you can't opt out of the test. They're coming because the Bible says there are many and they are very. God will test you to make you stronger. When the test comes, you can either turn on God or you can turn to God. Somebody told that to Pastor Hill, and he said, that's okay, God's big enough to handle it. What did they say? They said, I got mad at God. Now, you, you may never admit that, but uh, God's big enough to understand that. God's your Heavenly Father. God knows. God knows what's in the heart, and, and God knows. You could... Go back in time and say, did you ever get mad at mom or dad? And uh, if you didn't, praise God for that. But when they put their foot down or said no, or when they exercised some discipline, was it joyful? And perfect heavenly father, when the test comes, you can either turn on God or you can turn to God. And you thank God that he didn't allow you to do it if he didn't allow you to do it. Thank God that he put his foot down. Thank God that uh, he, he put something or someone in the way. The donkey saw it. You didn't see it. Don't get mad at the teacher for a hard test. He or she is trying to stretch you to prepare you for the next difficult task. Thank God for it. Don't get mad at God for a hard test. 
He's preparing you for the next one that comes so that you don't fall out on God. Here's last. Uh, I'm talking about that patience have its perfect work. There is a denial of self. There is a total dependence upon God. And then last, there is a delivery from the next catastrophe. You may not have experienced that, but maybe you've had some catastrophes in life. If you could turn back time, would there be anything different? The old adage is, if I do. And, and you, you can't go back. And a lot of times you can't unravel. You can't, uh, as my friend Larry Boggs would say, you can't unscramble scrambled eggs. It's a good one, isn't it? Delivery from the next catastrophe. Learn. In Psalm 91, verse 3, the Bible says, Surely he shall deliver me from the snare of the fowler, from the noisome pestilence. How is that? It's through endurance training. Psalm 119, verse 110, the Bible says, The wicked have laid a snare for me, yet I erred not from thy precepts. 2 Timothy 2, 26, the Bible says, And that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who have taken captive by him at his will. You go home sometime and get your concordance out and see how many times the word snare and snares are in your Bible. It's not an easy trip. Through much tribulation, we will enter into the kingdom of God. And there's snares and there's potholes and there's trip-ups along the way. The child of God is to allow the perfect work of patience to work in them so that they can be prepared and not surprised. God wants to deliver you from the next catastrophe that you could be about to fall into. The next snare. If you continue to stay in grade school spirituality, uh, you'll fall the next snare. If you can get to high school and, and uh, it's available to you in graduate school of the Bible, then you can be protected from the next snare. The next dangling carrot. You know where it's coming from. God doesn't put out anything there in front of you to get you to fall. That's the devil. God doesn't do anything to get you to quit. He gets you to continue. If you want to quit, that's of the devil. If you want to drop out of church, drop out of the Bible, drop away from Christianity and fall, that's not of God. It's of the devil. But to be able to strengthen you it comes from God. I'm out of time, but the Bible said there was divers and many. It means you could go around and testify of all that you've been through and all that God has brought you through. But there is endurance training. There's endurance in trials. There's patience. There's patience in prayer. There's patience in the Bible. One individual about prayer would say, well, God says, that the Bible says that whatever you ask in my name, that will I do. And Jesus said that. And a person will name that and claim that and then say that the prayer didn't get answered. <coughs> do you know there's a balance in the Bible? Because probably the, the greatest preacher, probably the greatest Christian outside of Jesus was Apostle Paul. He said, three times I asked for this. Three times. Thrice. It could have been one preacher said, three seasons of asking. God, I could do so much more if you would have this depart from me. If you, if you would take away this thorn, I, I could do so much more for you. For the cause of Christ, the glory of God. If you would do this, God said, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. He said, I'm going to do something better. He said, I'm going to give you grace to be able to bear it. And that way you will stay weak in the flesh and strong in the spirit. Why? Because you have to be able to deny yourself. You have to have total dependence upon God. And he will deliver you 
from that next catastrophe. That's the perfect work of patience in the life of the child of God. Help us to get there. Let's bow for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Word of God. And dear Lord, for the Holy Spirit of God that makes it real to our heart. We pray, dear Lord, as we study Scripture like that, that you'll give us better understanding than we were certainly able to even touch on. Help us, dear God, with endurance training. Help us to be prepared for what lies ahead. And knowing, dear God, that you promise that you'll go with us and that you are with us. You'll never leave us, never forsake us. You'll never lay on us anything more than we can bear, but will with the temptation provide a way of escape that we might be able to bear. Help us now, dear God. We ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake.